Dark Souls 3. Oh boy. After the community collectively banished Dark Souls 2 to the Shadow Realm, and on the back of honestly one of the greatest video games of all time, still waiting for that remaster from Soft, fans were super excited to learn that Miyazaki himself was coming back home with the milk and a new installment of the Dark Souls franchise. And funny enough, I was right there with the fan base, getting all giddy and excited, counting down the days until the launch of Dark Souls 3 especially after absolutely hating my first time playing Dark Souls 2 at launch. And after looking back at it recently in one of these videos, I've come to understand that I actually love that title far more than I ever gave it credit for. I love you, man. I love you too, bud. I won't dive too much into that right now, but if you're interested, I did do one of these videos on Dark Souls 2, so go check that out after, please. I, I need the clicks. Anyway, Dark Souls 2 popped a lot of people's cherries for the Soulsborne formula, and it's actually the most successful title in the franchise. I had several friends get into these games thanks to this gateway drug. And to be honest, it probably helped that the game came with the original Dark Souls 1 title included on some formats. Not 2 though, because that's not canon. Because he didn't make it. <laughs> So anyway, with our favorite foot-loving game dev in the driver's seat once again, that must mean Dark Souls is back, baby. Uh, kinda. Look, I loved playing through this game back at launch, and if memory serves, looking back, I actually almost 100%ed this. I played through it quite a few times doing a lot of new game pluses, but after revisiting it for this video, honestly, the game is lukewarm at best for me. I'm not sure if I've just gotten older or I've started to see things differently since I stopped drinking green monster energy drinks. But out of all these games that I've played for this series, I've had the most fun revisiting Dark Souls 2 and that should be wrong, right? Dark Souls 3 to me is like Star Wars The Force Awakens. It's a sequel that relies very, very heavily on the previous game and kind of just wants to ride that nostalgia. I mean, you have an undead castle setting, you have a dark swamp setting, skeletons in a catacomb. Underground lava field with fire demons in a large library. I mean, it's even got Anor Londo and the Firelink Shrine and Squidward. The game is definitely sucking Dark Souls 1's dick. But hey, it's got some awesome bosses and no bed of chaos. So, I mean, bonus points there, right? It's weird that the game so heavily references Dark Souls 1, and there's a real lack of Dark Souls 2 love here. There's a couple of mentions here and there, it is technically canon, but to be honest, they're just saying, hey, look, the last game we made, wasn't that so good? And it's even more stupid because, like I said, they gave that game away for free with this game on some formats. It's so stupid. I get that the story is about the world collapsing on itself like a dying star. That's why all these areas and NPCs huddle together in this game, because it's basically the end of the world. But it comes across super desperate, and some things in the game are just pure weak. Stats no longer feel like they break or hinder a player, which ironically I found more fun in Dark Souls 2. The world is not as interconnected as Dark Souls 1, and the lore is quite tame for the series. Though it did pop out some stellar DLC later on. Ring City honestly made me finally get why people are into BDSM. But there were some design choices that were just pure brain dead, like having a pretty big and major questline require you to talk to an NPC on a cliff where the only way you're gonna get to them is by provoking a skeleton hate mob. I think there'd be a lake so deep within these catacombs. Uh huh, yeah, that's really interesting. Can you hurry up, please? I finished the game and the DLC, and I'm gonna be honest, for a Souls game, it was just okay. And they should not be just okay. Now, before you crucify me in the comment section, this is a comparison to the other two titles in the series. I'm not saying Dark Souls 3 is a D tier video game. I've used this analogy a few times before, but it's like having a hundred pound steak. Not like a hundred pounds of steak, a hundred pounds steak from three different top quality restaurants. They on their own are absolutely fantastic and blow crappy cheap steaks out of the water. But you're gonna like one more than the other from these top tier restaurants. And that's what it's like. I didn't like this steak as much compared to the other ones I tried. But why is that? Well, to find out, let's dive in and see if Dark Souls 3 was really that good, or is it just a fading flame of a series that needs some real good kindling? 
So like I said, the world is plunging into darkness. Once again, it is up to you, the Ashen One, yes, that's you, to stop it and help turn the light off or on. It's kind of the same thing as Dark Souls 1. But I'm going to be honest, okay, I've tried twice now just to let nature take its course, but every single time I pick the ending that I think turns the machine off, it becomes not canon. So you know what? I will light this goddamn fire, but you bet your ass I am going to get myself a goth mummy bride and I will be the king of this bitch. Mark my words. This will shock you, but this time I'm going for a dexed build, but will be heavily pumping points into luck for something a little later on new to this game. Right off the bat, you will notice that Dark Souls 3 does implement a lot of new mechanics into the game. One specifically is weapon arts. Yes, just like Elden Ring, it started here, folks. Honestly, it's a great improvement having weapons rocking their own special move. It's great for builds, but it is kind of a double-edged sword in Dark Souls 3 because, I mean, where are all the weapons? There feels far less of them in Dark Souls 3 compared to any of the other titles. This was probably due to the time it took to cook these weapon arts, but at that point, why bother? And most of the weapons you come across, you won't use because there's always a better version just around the corner. In my example, I rushed straight away to get the great scythe because if i'm one thing it's consistent outside of youtube and i use this for all of two minutes because right after i got it a better scythe was available the corvian scythe it does everything the great scythe can do but better and it has good bleed as a caveat it does put bleed on the user barely you won't notice this wait wait hold on life hunt scythe is that you look on a mask with my boy so like I said, most weapons you find will be just placement holders till the real boys start dropping. But don't worry, while you explore for these hidden gems, the game will be constantly kicking you in the dick. Now this might be a personal problem, completely me orientated, but the overworld really fucking hates the player. Usually in Souls games, the exploration is pretty tame till you hit the boss, and that's where the difficulty skyrockets. But in Dark Souls 3, I found myself having far more of a problem in these exploration segments than, to be honest, any boss in the entire game. Do you want to know what killed me the most in my entire playthrough? I'll give you some hints. It was not the twins boss fight. It was an Eldridge. It wasn't the final boss in the base game, and it wasn't the final fight in the last piece of DLC against Slave Knight Gale. It was this goddamn mob not 20 minutes into the playthrough. This red-eyed son of a bitch fucked me in the ass so much he could probably draw the interior from memory. This guy sucks. <laughs> I just was not getting it with him. And this ends up being a theme throughout the game. Random mobs having massive health bars and taking out way too much health on their hits. You should not need to Estus Flask after every single poke. Hell, these hollows holding just a big stick gave me more trouble than the Nameless King. And I am not over exaggerating. I don't know, maybe I just need to get good, but to be honest, most of the bosses, I had flawless runs, except the Sage. Fuck the Sage, man. I thought I was playing Dark Souls, not Binding of Isaac. What was I talking about again? Oh, yeah. Anyway, you start your run at Firelink Shrine. Yeah, because you, you Dark Souls 1 was a thing. 
and you are tasked with killing four of the Lords of Cinders to grant you access to the final boss. We have Yorm the Giant, the Abyss Watchers, Eldritch the Saint of the Deep, and Lothric and his roided out brother. To do this, we have to explore the land, and though it is a bit predictable with the set pieces, it doesn't really stretch too far away from the traditional formula. I think the areas do look good, I, I have to give credit. Especially Illithil. My god, this was a treat to explore- <laughs> Actually, I take that back. Just like with Dark Souls 2, you will need to do far more crowd control. And honestly, if you don't set out with something like a bow or ranged magic, you're going to have a bad time. But unlike Dark Souls 2, where it was just copy and paste most of the time, it's more tactical how these mobs have been placed. It feels more like a chess match than just running through gunning down mobs through an exploration section. And along the way, we will meet a decent amount of NPCs. Our favorite Winnie the Pooh in a suit of armor is back, and his questline has us team up against mobs, breaking them out of jail, breaking them out of a well. Dude, this guy gets captured all the time. Unfortunately, in my playthrough, just like Dark Souls 1, it ends abruptly. One of the most obscure quest lines is for the hollow ending, where you do a bunch of, honestly, BS that can be very easily missed in true FromSoft fashion, but it does lead to the main character actually canonically getting hitched to best girl Anri in some weird necrophilia stuff. Uh, I don't know. She has to die for this to play out. Was it good for you? This ending plays quite well with my build as well, to be honest. I infused my scythe to be a hollow weapon, which is new to Dark Souls 3, which means it doesn't just scale with dex, it will also scale with my luck stat. And the more hollow I become, the more damage I output with it. It's pretty good. And going hollow in this game doesn't actually have really any negative effects. You get the buff that I just mentioned for some weapons. You get five free level ups from this guy. And you get the babe. It's a win, win, win. Just don't look in the mirror. You're ugly. You are disgusting. I'm going to kill you. Give me $200. Patches also makes his classic return in all of his trollishy assholeness by tricking us thinking he is the Onion Knight himself. But in actuality, he stole his armor. What a dick. Say hello to the nice giant. He adores visitors. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the old giant? What? Where's the bloody giant? Just what have you done? How dare you? Have you no shame? Damn. Damn. Damn and damn. Damn, damn. Yeah, I'm coming for you, bitch. So our first Lord of Cinder is the Abyss Watchers, and I I really like this fight. It's basically a fan meetup of all these notorious enjoyers, and we just kind of interrupt their RP session and take them all on. But because these guys are just endlessly fighting each other, some will actually aggro the main watcher. So you actually kind of get teammates. Just don't hit them because you'll take the aggro from the boss. And you know this is the boss watcher because he has the bigger health bar. Their movement is super agile and really does give us some notorious vibes. And honestly, the whole game overall is much faster paced than Dark Souls 1 and 2. You can really tell that they've taken the mechanics from Bloodborne and tried to implement them into a Dark Souls game. And in some cases, it could be a bit BS, like with the Frost Knights. What, what is happening? I, Jesus Christ. But it does make the boss fights feel more like a dance rather than a turn-based RPG where you just wait for your time to hit. I also love that for the first time, these guys are rocking a Dex Greatsword that has a parry knife. Like, it's an excellent boss weapon if you want to run it. It has a cool weapon art as well. 
Second phase has a beefed up watcher with the same moveset, but now he has this weird flame after image after his attacks. And honestly, it's pretty hard to dodge. I felt like I just had to tank a lot of these hits with this guy because, I mean, you can dodge the initial strike, but the flame will probably hit you straight after. You can't dodge both in most instances. But after defeating the watchers, we venture into a spooky skeleton home and then hell. Well, at least there's not dragon butts this time. Remember when I said some overworld mobs seemed harder than bosses? Father, the sleeper has awakened! Next, we venture through Demon Souls and honestly get one of the best jump scares I've witnessed in gaming for a while. <laughs> I just made poopy. Wait, that wasn't the jump scare. No, I actually meant this guy. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. The jailers in this area are pretty annoying as well. They will shrink down your maximum health when they just look at you, so you can very easily get one tapped if you're not careful in this area. Venturing further down, we will find Yorm the Giant, our second Lord of Cinder fight, and this is a gimmick fight. Though having Squidward walking right after you for a 2v1 if you follow his quest line, that's pretty hype stuff, but he will most likely die, and he died in my playthrough, so I'm really glad I spent hours doing his quest line for him to walk in this room and get knocked out. The actual fight is a breeze. It's like the alpha version of the God Devouring Serpent from Elden Ring. You just have to use the weapon that's already in the arena to beat him. He is super weak to it and it will stagger him every time you use the weapon art. Super easy boss if you cheese him. Next is Aldridge and she is taking up housing in, you guessed it, an Orlando. And though it is far smaller than the original, I would be lying if I didn't say it's great to see this place again. Actually redact that. It's here where I really got a feel of being invaded and the duality of some of the invaders you can find. One guy invaded me and led me to an area far away from mobs to do a standard 1v1, which honestly, mad respect to the guy. He did destroy me, like obliterated me, but he was a good sportsman about it. Then another guy invaded me and, well... Cool. But I don't know, maybe it's contagious because I also got a bit of revenge on an invasion myself. As soon as I got invaded, I decided to just lay down with an emote that you can find. Honestly, the best one. And see if this guy could find me and he really couldn't. <laughs> No way. No way. <laughs> huh? Eventually, he did find my Ashinasi, so I sent him back home. That honestly was so much fun. I want to chase that feeling. I now get why so many YouTubers do those prank invasions. It's great fun. Anyway, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, Aldridge gives people so many issues, but I have always gone for a melee build, so she isn't much of an issue for me. Her moves are quite easy to avoid when you're up close and personal. 
Just make sure when she teleports to the other side of the arena, you book it to her straight away, or she'll just become a Quincy and see how many arrows she can fit in your butthole. It's honestly the only move I found to be a problem. Rest of the fight, pretty easy. I quickly realized this was the same arena where we fought Oristine and Smoke all those years ago in Dark Souls 1, so I got quite excited for what could be just upstairs. My disappointment is immeasurable, and my day is ruined. The last of the four souls we need is in the back end of Lothric Castle, and this section honestly is bloody awesome. We have dragons, we have an absolutely awesome entry boss with the dancer, we have these super cool backdrops, like just, I, I don't know what these are, but they look cool, and the eclipse, oh, it's beautiful. One of my favorite areas of the game. We even have to go through an archives to get to the boss and we deal with these weird wax mobs. Again, I love the creativity of these enemies and the game throughout doesn't really copy and paste enemies. There's a lot of variety in them, but I'm going to be honest, the spooky ghost hands coming out of the walls. This looks out of place in Dark Souls 3. Anyone else? This is some straight up Scooby-Doo shit right here. The boss fight is with Lothric and his brother and like many of the other bosses, it's pretty easy to deal with, but in the second phase, they just decide to just throw magic bullshit to dodge. I hate this almost as much as gang fights in Dark Souls 2. But if you can avoid the magic, the melee attacks are pretty easy to avoid. And just make sure you kill little bro first because he will heal the big guy and prolong the boss fight if you don't. All right, so with Lothric dead, we can now technically head to the final boss. But first, let's head to the gardens of Lothric Castle and dunk on this dragon that has some serious maternal issues. We get a gesture here to take us to Arch Dragon Peak. Doing the emote at this statue here, we get another gimmick boss where we have to do like a Gmod death run through the area while we're being gunned down by this dragon till we get to a cliff and we can one tap him. Super easy to do, but honestly quite exhilarating. I generally clinched my butthole in this section and every time an enemy just strolled out as I was booking it to the cliff, it made me skip a few heartbeats. It was very adrenaline inducing. The main course of this area is the Nameless King, and he is a different story entirely. To access him, we must ring a bell, and just like with Dark Souls 1, you can hear when other players are actually ringing the bell themselves as you're exploring Dragon Arch Peak. It's really cool, it's the opposite, where back in Dark Souls 1, it was the sound of a hollow completing the first real challenge of the game. It was a victory ring. Here it signifies someone has just locked in and is now fighting one of the hardest bosses in the game. And my god, the boss itself is just pure cinema. The foreboding weather, the fact that we're fighting on top of an actual cloud. I mean, even his entrance is hype as fuck. He's riding a dragon, bro. We had like eight dragon riders in Dark Souls 2 and they were not riding dragons. What the fuck was that? Unfortunately, the first face of this fight, it sucks, man. You think the biggest problem you'll have will be either the Jesus looking guy or the giant chicken he's riding, but it's actually the lock-on system. The boss is near impossible to fight when you use the lock-on. It constantly screws you up. I Most of the time, I had no idea what was going on and what was going to hit me or what move the Nameless King was about to use. It's so aggravating. It's honestly a bit unfair. I probably would have had an easier time just closing my eyes and just winging the fight. But once we take out the dragon, the Nameless King will uh, make sure we did a good job. What the fuck? And then the true fight starts and it is a spectacle of a fight. It's honestly a lot easier than when he was on the dragon, but it's so great to do. Once you learn the move pattern, it feels so good dodging his attacks. 
and none of them really feel too cheap. Definitely up there as one of my top 10 bosses in these games. So goddamn good. So we have a pocket full of Cinder Lord Souls. We're married to our dead waifu and look like rotten meat. I think it's time to put an end to this nonsense and take out the final boss. But... First, we have two very solid DLCs to take out. Ashes of Arendelle and The Ringed City. Arendelle starts off in a snowy plains where we get ganked by a bunch of wolves and... Sif, is that you? Oh shit, guys, he's gone rabid. We quickly meet Sister Freed and she basically says, it's cool that we're here, but could we kindly fuck right off and finish the base game? We don't belong in this painted world. Okay, that was pretty rude. So I'm going to do the exact opposite and explore this area and all its fugliness. Also, I bet everyone hit this NPC for the first time they were playing right. He must get hit by everyone or am I just an asshole? There's an optional fight here where we fight Sif's big brother. It's not too bad. And after exploring what I assume is Asmongold's downstairs living room, we find and open the door to the final boss fight. And I love how this entire area is built in like a circle. You explore what seems like quite far and then just as you open the door back at the start for the boss fight, it loops in on itself. Great game design. Miyazaki, you are a true blessing. And speaking of Miyazaki. Fret not, father. We have no need of thy flail. Is only the flame quivering at misguided ash. There it is, boys. Let's go. <laughs> Walking around barefoot on those dirty floors? She must have dark souls. <laughs> Jesus. I loved and then quickly grew to hate this boss fight. Sister Freed walks in and pulls out a scythe of her own. So me personally, I felt like it was a more interesting boss fight. We weren't fighting just for the sake of it. We were fighting to see who was the best at harvesting wheat. She rocks a frost scythe, so I threw on a flame to make the fight seem more epic. Once defeated, the big guy in the back of the room, which I think was her dad, Mercy reses her, and now we have to deal with both of them. You can use Slave Knight Gale's summon sign here, which I did. It will make the fight a lot easier. It's a tough boss, but not too bad. Why is the boss music still playing? There's a third phase. I'm going to be honest. I was quite hyped when this first happened because it broke that traditional two phase formula. It was a surprise that you come to expect from these games. But my God, it is a test of your endurance. She still has somewhat the same moveset, but now she just cakes everything in this black flame. Oh great, another boss that has attacks that have two hit procs, so near to each other that it's almost impossible to dodge both. Fun. In my opinion, she is probably the hardest boss in the game, not including this guy. Fuck this guy. <laughs> but she's still basically Melania if she was mid, so not too bad. Once she's defeated, we get two bonfires for the price of one. One just being a standard boss fire for the boss arena and the other one leading to the second DLC, The Ringed City. And this place is pretty fucking cool, guys. I know I've said that a lot, but towards the end of the game, it did feel like they started putting a bit more creativity into the areas, which I really like. It starts in a dilapidated world and there are literal angels here. Motherfucking angels trying to deliver us a swift death. It's pretty insane. It's a difficult area. And the gameplay is a little bit different too. You don't really go out and fight mobs. You're kind of just hiding the entire time, jumping from safe area to safe area. It's really interesting. So you can probably tell I like this area a lot. And it's not just because the devs have based enemy placement. <laughs> Running through the area, you have to put a lot of faith into these messages on the ground, telling you it's safe to drop down from quite a height. I'm not sure this is how Ash actually works and if it's soft when it's a pile. But hey, doesn't work how it works in Assassin's Creed, so nah, I'm not going to judge it. It's game logic. One drop will lead us to a fight against the demon princes. This will look like a ridiculous fight you've just been rushed into, but it just ends up being a bait and hit fight. The tactic I use is when both of these guys were pissed off, I just outrun everything. I didn't try to get any damage, I just got away. One will tuck her out eventually, and then you can do some damage on the one that still has zoomies that's trying to fight you as he's easier to dodge on his own. I tried going for the slower one a bit, but honestly, when he's tuckered out, you're better off leaving him and dealing with the faster one because as you fight the slower one, the faster one will just start hitting you off screen. It's not worth it. 
But the meat of the dish is the ringed sea. And after beating the princes, our favorite New Londo taxi service picks us up and, oh no, it's the bridge. <laughs> Why, man? This bit sucks. The lanky asshole on the other side will just constantly summon archers that, let's be honest, if you get tagged by them, you might as well put the controller down because you're going back to the last bonfire. Unless you're like me. We also get probably the sickest looking mobs from From Software to date in this DLC. The Ring City Knights literally look like a Metal Band poster, and I love it. I loved it so much, I decided to RP them once I got all their armor sets to drop. Obviously, not changing the Fallen Night Helm. This is a staple, and this thing is beautiful. Do not kink shame me. The area is tough and bonfires are pretty lacking in this DLC, but uh, to be honest, it makes sense. This is the last area of Dark Souls as a whole. But lore-wise, it kind of makes sense too. This is the end of the world. Ain't nobody camping out here. We bitch slap a dragon. So long, eh, Bowser. And we get a boss that's pretty familiar to us. This is a reference back to the old monk boss in Demon Souls, as a player will spawn in as the boss if you're online. It's a pretty nice callback, but I'm sure it probably does make some stupid experience. The guy I got generally fought me like a normal lad, loved it, but if a player doesn't fight back, I could see this being very awkward. Once that is done, we meet Philinor, one of Gwyn's daughters, and we touch her egg because why not? Uh, that wasn't me. Women, am I right? Welcome to the last boss of the DLC against the Slave Knight Gale. Yep, that guy that was helping us pretty much throughout all the DLCs, he is the fight. And he starts off pretty primal, jumping around like one of those Abyss Watchers. But the boss fight does eventually get more and more difficult as you play through. And it is absolutely draw dropping. This fight, again, pure cinema and epic in every way. The music isn't having a smoke out back either. It is locked in and going hard. Just listen. It's such a good fight and I'll even give a pass on the stupid after image attacks that he does because it's literally just his cape that's wet hand slapping me in the face each time. Some of his attacks even cause lightning to crash down on the ground. Ah, oh, it's so good. I don't know, something about learning this boss's pattern and executing dodges perfectly and finding those moments to attack. It feels like I'm finally seeing the Matrix or something. It clicks so hard. This right here, this moment is why I love Dark Souls and these types of games. The grandeur of the fight, the lore being downright depressing, and nothing that really feels too cheap or gimmicky. It's just kind of a pure one-on-one -on -one sword play fight in a big arena. Oh, it's fantastic. I loved it so much. To me, it's just like the Atorius fight I loved so much back in Dark Souls 1. Or the Sir Alon fight in Dark Souls 2 is honestly so good. It's a pretty difficult boss fight, but it's not ridiculously difficult. It's a good fight to have under your belt. Fuck, man. That was so good. I need a cigarette or something. Jesus. Okay, so the DLC is defeated. It's time to light up these boys' souls and go forth and beat the Lord of Cinder. Eh, boss fight's okay. At least it's not Gwyn again. As I'm going for the Hollow Lord ending, I bring in my Londo groupies, and uh, to be honest, we just destroy him. The fight is kind of cool. The Lord of Cinder does have a few different phases where he switches weapons and builds throughout the fight. But man, this combo attack here can just do one. Cheap moves like this don't give it an S-star status like Gale. 
But with the Cinder Lord out of the picture, it is time to light the flame once more. But this time, instead of being the Kindle, I'm going to just run this bitch as king. For me, you know what? Hollow's got a bad rap. People kind of treat us like a plague. It's time to rise up. I am starting a revolution. And after getting an extremely cool shot of us walking into the camera, the credits fade in. And I cannot wait for Dark Souls 4 to make this ending not canon, just like my other playthroughs. Oh man, Dark Souls 3 was a great time, but I'm gonna be honest, it is the weakest in the series for me. It played it far too safe and relied far too heavily on its nostalgia to keep the player invested. Yes, I liked seeing the old faces, and yes, I loved revisiting old locations like Anor Londo. These places I have come to love in the series, but I'm not an idiot, Miyazaki, I know what you're doing. It feels a bit desperate and not including content from Dark Souls 2 feels awfully mean for no reason. Yes, there's a few things nodding back to that game. So yes, the game does in fact exist in the canon, but why bother if that's all you're gonna give it? Dark Souls 3 is a celebration of Dark Souls 1 and uh, I haven't seen much research and evidence of this, but it feels like it wasn't even something Miyazaki wanted to make necessarily. To me, he feels like a one and done dev. He makes his masterpiece and then wants to move on to the next one. That's how this guy thrives. And he does some goddamn good content doing it. But I have a sneaking suspicion that this was a FromSoft and shareholders decision and them wanting a big payday. And I mean, going by the sale numbers, they got it. And it isn't bad. Miyazaki did put in work, but it does feel just a bit weak. The steak just wasn't that good for me compared to the others. And I don't know if I'm in the majority or the minority in that. Please let me know. This has been a hell of a project, guys. I have really enjoyed revisiting these games back to back. I can't believe my opinion changed so much on Dark Souls 2. And the fact that now in my rankings, the games look like this. That's wild. Dark Souls 2 took the crown. I, I definitely didn't see that coming. These games not only started a whole sub genre, but really goes to show you that when a dev is so passionate about a project, it can honestly make waves in the industry. It isn't just that Miyazaki has this godlike golden touch, it's just that he cares about his art and it's sad to say there isn't much left of that in AAA titles nowadays. But it's not all doom and gloom, we are starting to see more and more devs finally start to give a shit about what they pump onto discs. So hopefully we'll start seeing more stellar titles hitting shelves in the coming years. And that goddamn Bloodborne remaster, Jesus Christ, honestly I would take a PC port at this point. Ah! I would like to take a moment to shout out these Ashen Lords for supporting me and my content on Patreon. Honestly, you guys help me out so much. I have nothing but undying respect to you. Thank you, Pitstab, Ali Tato, The Shane 209, and Chris Spicer. You guys are the humanity that stops this channel going hollow. We still have a couple of titles to look at from this beautiful, beautiful man, but I have another project that I can't put off much longer, so if you thought the pain I had to go through playing through these games and their difficulty was bad, you haven't seen true torture yet. See you next time, guys. As always, stay safe out there. Tie out. Peace.